Living the Artist's Way, An Intuitive Path to Greater Creativity by Julia Cameron. Week six, inviting commitment. There is a big storm outside, so hopefully the audio will be able to cut it off. But if that's what you hear in the background, all is well. Okay, inviting commitment. In this final week, you will come to value perseverance. You will deepen your practice of writing for guidance and hopefully commit to it as a long-term habit. By now, guidance may seem second nature and you may have had experiences to convince you that it is not, in fact, your imagination and that it is a valuable tool to use in every aspect of your life. Mentally, physically, and emotionally, guidance brings you valuable balance. The simple question, what's next? helps us set our priorities in order. Guidance tutors us in the right next action. And so what next? Ask your guidance. Prayer. The wind is gusting 60 miles per hour. The temperature has plunged 40 degrees. Rain is predicted by nightfall and it's said to continue for two days. My power blinked out, shutting down my air conditioners, but I won't be needing them tonight. If anything, my house will be too cool. My friend Scotty phones me from San Diego where it is 80. She keeps an eye on Santa Fe weather. She wants to warn me of the impending cold snap and the stormy weather predicted. She keeps an eye out for my well-being. I'll light some incense on your behalf, she tells me, for your weather and for your writing. I thank her for her concern. It feels good to be looked after. Night is falling fast and a last glimpse at the darkening sky shows storm clouds. Weather aside, the day felt turbulent. I reread my book on prayer, preparing for next Sunday's teaching. The chapters I read were on prayers of petition, asking God for what we want, presuming God's benevolence and generosity. Prayers of petition take daring. We stand naked before our maker, asking for a boon. God has three answers for us. Yes, no, and not now. Praying, we hope for an affirmative. God's denial or delay demands our acceptance and understanding. The wisdom of God's answer is often revealed only later in cozy retrospect. Reading about prayers of petition, I felt myself vulnerable, as if I were praying, not merely reading. God Almighty is the giver of all graces. Asking for a desire, we acknowledge that God is all-powerful, able to grant or not grant, our heartfelt wishes. And if God denies our request, we feel anger or at best, frustration. We need to remind ourselves of God's wisdom and benevolence. God is all merciful, we need to affirm. Reading over the chapter I had written, I reminded myself that my intention is writing about prayer was to render prayer easier, less daunting than than is commonly felt. Prayers of petition are human and understandable, I wrote. We lay our requests at the feet of a compassionate God, that God knows the secrets of our hearts. Please keep me safe in the storm. I petition God now as night falls and the first drops of rain streak my windows. My friend Scott Thomas phones me to stay. The storm is hitting hard at his house. Is it at mine? I tell him about my power blinking off, blessedly back on again in moments. You're not in the dark then? He asks. No, I'm fine. And I have flashlights and candles. I reassure him. Just checking on you, he says, and I feel the glow of his concerned affection. I live alone and the calls from my friends keep me from feeling isolated. Just checking on you, I'm a lively phones to say. She keeps a close tab on my well-being. Did you drink enough water today? She asks. I'll drink some now. I promise her, adding that water is coming down in sheets, drenching the last embers of last week's fire. I've got you in prayers, she tells me next. I feel her goodwill. The storm rattles the windows and shakes the chimney. I petition God one more time just to get his attention. Please, God, keep me and my little dog safe. I feel the calm of an answered prayer. (sighs) 
Miguel de Unamuno says, only one who attempts the absurd is capable of achieving the impossible. The first week of September, I woke to discover snow had fallen during the night. My pinion tree was draped in white. My courtyard glistened with several inches of snow. Fog blotted out the mountains as on their slopes more snow was falling. Damn it, I breathed, greeting the snowfall with dismay. Last year's winter was severe and long. I wasn't ready for another harsh season. I'm sad and dismayed, I wrote in my morning pages. I wanted sympathy for my bleak mood. Who could I call? I settled on Scotty in sunny Dan San Diego, but she proved a bad choice. When I complained of the early snow, she sang, enjoy the beauty, hardly a sympathetic note. Next, I tried Jennifer in sunny South Florida. She was more understanding. It will pass, she advised me, and it did help to think of the snow as a passing anomaly, not the harbinger of more snow and cold. It's a cold snack, pronounced my neighbor, Michelle Warsa, empathizing the fact that soon it would once again be warm. Snap implied rapidity. The snow would soon be gone. It was Michelle's birthday and she did not complain of the weather. Was she a pretty naturally good sport or did she welcome winter despite our abbreviated fall? The day stayed gray. The fog thickened. At twilight, there was a peal of thunder and rain fell in place of snow. Wet, chill, unwelcome. As the temperatures dropped with nightfall, the rain gelled into snow. The world was once again turning white. Enjoy the beauty, I scolded myself with Scotty's words. I called my friend Scott Biersu, a native New Yorker. It snowed. I wailed, it's snowing. So we heard, Scott replied, in early winter? I hope not. Last year was hard and I've been hoping this year would be mild. It's beyond our control, Scott spoke gravely. I've been fighting with God all day, I told him. Tomorrow might be better, Scott promised. You are a voice to God's ear, I responded. Nightfall was quick and inky black. The fog obscured the moon. A long peal of thunder announced the storms continuing. The predictions were for continued rain mixed with snow. By week's end, and not before, the weather would relent. Helen Keller says, Remember, no effort that we make to attain something beautiful is ever lost. Asking for guidance, I'm told to write about rest and relaxation, and so I shall. Seeking guidance, I find it comes to me most easily when I am rested and relaxed. And so today I heat, I hear, so today I hear, talk about ease. As if sensing my relief, Lily stretches out languorously on the cool tile floor. I have found her ESP to be excellent. When I'm anxious, she's anxious. When I am calm, as now, she is calm. Nightly I ask for guidance and when I am calm, it comes easily. All is well. I would venture that calm is a prerequisite for effective prayer. We have to stay positive, declares Scott Thomas, who calls nightly and practices what he preaches. Negativity just breeds negativity, and we have to avoid that. Scott's voice is calm and firm. He prays daily for guidance, and his prayers to the ancestors are rewarded by a flow of direction for his days. It was smoky today, he, te he tells me. The mountains looked hazy. His voice holds a rumble of concern. His nightly phone call reports a productive day. His guidance leads him to productivity. His calm lends itself to focus. All is well with him as he practices his daily Lakota rituals, praying to the ancestors and receiving their care. His guidance comes to him easily, the reward for his faithful prayer. My phone shrills. The caller is Laura Letty, another calm practitioner of daily prayer. How are you? She wants to know. How is teaching going? So far, so good. I tell her, pleased that she asks. I have you in prayers, she tells me, and I know that Laura's prayers are powerful, steady, and calm. Thanks for the booster, I tell her, ever grateful for her prayers. Her voice is soft and gentle. Her manner is the same. I'm always glad to pray for you, Laura says firmly. I thank her once again and we end the call. Nightfall cloaks the mountains. I'm grateful to have heard from friends. Grateful my friends are prayerful. Obeying my guidance, I am rested and relaxed. I hear, little one, 
You're on track. All is well. Calm and centered, I say, thanks. Joseph Campbell says, follow your bliss and don't be afraid. And doors will open where you didn't know there were going to be. Write for guidance. Fill in the following. Number one, I would like to petition God to. Number two, I am fighting with God over. Number three, I felt a sense of ease when. Now write for guidance on these issues. What do you hear? Do you get a sense that God's timing may indeed be the best timing? Can a connection to your guidance bring you ease and grace? The ease of a supportive network. I'm just checking on you, Jennifer tells me. Are you well? I'm fine, I answer, hoping my voice has the lilt of optimism. Well then, I'll talk to you tomorrow, Jennifer promises, ringing off. The call and the checkup are welcome. Separated as we are by thousands of miles, Jennifer is in Florida. I am in New Mexico. Our telephone contact is critical to our sense of well-being. Recently, Jennifer suffered a severe allergic reaction to a new medication. She broke out in terrible welts that burned and itched. Hearing her long-distance report, I worried, and so I called her twice daily, just to check on her. With my friendships far flung, Andrew in London, Emma in New York, Laura in Chicago, I make a point of telephone calls and cards, all saying, I love you, I miss you, how are you? I try to call, if not daily, often. My guidance tells me, be loving, be verbal, and so I am. How are you? My beloved mentor, Juliana, asks me when I have called to check on her. I'm good, I say, feeling better for having made our connection. Julianne has been a constant presence in my life for 41 years. Now that we have Zoom, I see her, not just hear her. At 91, she is, in her words, a crone. But her beloved face belies the years. I'm so grateful for our contact. Your beloveds are safe in my keeping, Guidance assures me. But I pray near daily for their health and well-being. I am relieved talking to Gerard to hear him, steady as he goes. A temperature man, he fields my weekly calls with good humor. He fares well, my guidance tells me, and Gerard himself says the same. Most of my friendships are decades long, but my new friend, writer Jacob Nordby, has earned a place in my heart. Jacob is a calm and loving presence, assuring me of my place in his prayers. He prays for me when I'm teaching or when I'm having a difficult interview. I am grateful for his spiritual intercession on my behalf. My guidance tells me he is a kindred spirit, and so I find him. Trust your network, guidance advises me, and so I do. Writing a friendship, I think of Jeanette who repeatedly assures me, you are not alone, and I'm not. Accompanied by my far-flung friends, I live alone, but not in isolation. Our love and loyalty connect us, and so when Jennifer calls just to check on me, I truthfully say, I'm fine. J. John and Mark Stibb say, if the only prayer you said in your whole life was thank you, that would suffice. Smoke from California fires has drifted all the way to New Mexico. Walking Lily, my eyes sting, although Nick says his eyes aren't bothered. Blinking against the smoky wind, I ask Nick how he's doing. Fine, he declares, his voice firm and steady. We walk Lily for half an hour, and if the smoke is bothering her, she doesn't show it. Back at home, I'm grateful to be back in air-conditioned splendor, away from the smoke. My eyes burn, and I look out the windows to the west where a fiery sun is setting. The sky burns reddish-orange. Smoke is the cause. Entering the house, my phone shrills. The caller is Scott Thomas, reporting in on a long and smoky day. Did you see the sunset? He asks. The smoke turns the sky orange. I saw it, I said, and I felt it. Walking Lily, my eyes stung. Mine were okay, Scott reports. There must be most smoke, more smoke up where you are. Yes, I think so, I say. So it's fall. The pear's tree's leaves are red and gold. I'm dreading winter, I confess. Oh dear, you have to accept it. The calm and the beauty. The cold, 
I complain. Well, yes, there's that. Scott chuckles. He has resigned to the coming cold. Agreed to disagree on the approaching season, we get off the phone. As soon as I put the receiver back in its cradle, the phone shrills again. This time, the caller is Jennifer, checking in on me again. I'm fine, I tell her, but my eyes sting. There's smoke in the air. Not another fire, Jennifer exclaims. Smoke from California's fires, I exclaim. That's a pity. How's Lily? She seems fine. The smoke didn't seem to bother her. That's just great. Can you rinse your eyes? I could. I think it would help. As always, Jennifer is filled with advice. I'm four days into using the MA roller she prescribed for my back. It will change your life, she told me, and using it, a painful process. My back pain afterward is lessened, and so welcoming Jennifer's pragmatism, I rinse my eyes, and as she predicted, it helps. Better? She asks. Better, I tell her. We get off the phone, both feeling better for her advice. Lily licks her paws. Maybe there is a smoky tang clinging to her coat. She climbs next to me on the arm of the love seat. Her breathing is deep and even. She is relaxed. Treat, Lily? I ask her and together we pad to the kitchen. I scoop up a handful of our liver-flavored flavored treats. One at a time, I send them skittering across the floor and Lily scampers after them. A good day, eh, girl? Despite the smoke? I close the dog door, shutting her in for the night. Ralph Waldo Emerson says, All I have seen teaches me to trust the Creator for all I have not seen. Write for guidance. List three supportive people in your network. Now list three people you could offer support to. Ask your guidance. Number one, who should I reach out to for support? Number two, Who should I reach out to in order to offer my support? Reach out to these people and note what happens. Do you experience synchronicity or sense a higher hand at play? Santosh Kalwar says, The truth about life and lie about life is not measured by others, but by your intuition, which never lies. Maxine Hong Kingston says, in a time of destruction, create something. Holding the faith. (sighs) I taught today and taught well. My guidance was clear and sharp. Open the class with poetry and song. I did as directed, reading two poems from my collection, This Earth, then singing a song of wisdom. Time is like a river. Although I could not see my class, I could sense them, and we launched from there into the deep end with questions on prayers of gratitude. Starting with the beauties of the natural world, we listed our blessings. I could feel the intense focus of the group. Blessings listed raised the energy of the students. The afternoon sped fast, sped past. Now it is evening, and as dusk settles, it brings with it calm. Tiny birds flit to the pinion tree. They will rest in its branches overnight. Lily has also found a resting spot, curling up on the living room's colorful rug. With all the world easing into nightfall, I seek guidance on the day's events. Julia, your class went well. There's no cause for anxiety. You were smooth and helpful. Perhaps so, but I feel no elation over a job well done. Instead, I feel empty, hollow devoid of emotion. Perhaps I'm tired. Perhaps the class took all of my energy. I lie down to rest, but the phone shrills. Groggy, I answer it. The caller is my daughter, wanting to know how the day's teaching went. It went well, I tell her. Both Emma and Nick said so, but I feel empty. Do you want feedback? Okay. I think it's a performance thing. When I do a play, there are nights when I feel empty afterward and it has nothing to do with the quality of my work. People assure me my performance was fine. I'm just numb. My energy is spent. It happens. I'm grateful for my daughter's diagnosis. It makes my mood a normal thing. If my nerves before teaching are stage fright, my lack of emotion afterwards is a let down performers also experience. I don't have a name for it, but it's part of a performance life a performer's life cycle. When I hadn't thought of teaching as a performance, 
while I hadn't thought of teaching as a performance, clearly it was. One more time, my guidance has something to say. You are needing help to have an overview. For today, try to believe Nick and Emma. They felt you did well, and they are both honest. You are tired and wired. You taught well, and now you can release your anxiety. Frederick Nish says, only thoughts that come by walking have any value. When the guidance names my mood anxiety, I realize that I'm not so much empty as anxious. I want to be a reassured that my class was indeed good and not flat as my emotions would have me fear. Perhaps it's normal to want reassurance, but I find my insecurity tiresome. Shouldn't I be able to keep my own counsel? One more time I turn to guidance. I hear, Julia, you are a perfectionist and you want assurance your class was perfect. Allow yourself to be human. Lower the bar. Accept that your class was good, good enough, and good enough is more than good enough. Good advice and wise counsel. Now, if I can just take it. As if to console me, Lily pads to my side. All is well. Her presence assures me. And indeed, all is well. John Moyer says, I only went out for a walk and finally concluded to stay out till sundown. For going out, I found, was really going in. One more day of smoky wind. Walking Lily, my eyes sting again. This time, I cut our walk short. The smoke is too much for me. Safely back inside the house, I phone Jennifer, knowing she will have compassion for my stinging eyes. Smoky again? She asks. Yes, I tell her dolefully. As bad as yesterday? Bad enough, I answer. I think I need patience. Surely the smoke will clear soon. You're a voice to God's ear, Jennifer says gravely. Meanwhile, rinse your eyes and keep an eye on Lily. Getting off the phone, I do keep an eye on Lily. She seems unfazed, although perhaps annoyed by our abbreviated walk. She stretches out beside me on the love seat, a comforting presence. Good girl, I tell her. Jacob Nordby calls me next from Boise, Idaho. He reports that Boise is now smoke-free, having been bedeviled as badly as Santa Fe by smoke drifting in from the west. I'm going for a hike, Jacob reports. The air quality is good again. We're still smoky, I tell him, self-pity saturating my tone. I hope it clears for you soon, Jacob sympathizes. I hate to hear you suffering. Compassion rumbles through the wire. Jacob is a kind man and an empathetic one. I'm grateful for his concern. Envying him, his clear skies, I wish him happy hiking. There is no hiking for me here in smoky Santa Fe. Taking pen to page, I next query guidance. What to do about the smoke? I am told, Julia, the smoke will clear. Try to have patience. There is nothing to be gained by agitation. Stay indoors and avoid the smoky wind. Soon enough, the skies will one more time be clear. And so, tutored to have patience, I look to the mountains and discover them hazy but sharply etched. The smoke is lessening. Soon, like Jacob, I'll be able to go hiking. Santa Fe, like Boise, will have clear skies. One more time, the tiny birds flit into the pinion trees' inner recesses. A lone raven circles the tree but doesn't land. Evening is settling. I get one more call, this one from Corey, a girlfriend. She reports sadly that she has encountered a flock of dead sparrows on her property. Victims of smoky air? I wonder. Delicate creatures, to be sure. I recall passing the tiny corpse of a songbird as I walked to Lily. Its chest was red and gold, the colors of the setting sun, as if the bird were a tiny particle of the sunset fallen to earth. Now a half moon rises above the mountains. I call Lily indoors and lock her dog door. It's time for bed. Perhaps tomorrow will be better. Rebecca Solnit says, walking is how the body measures itself against the earth. The sun is setting in colored ribbons. The moon is rising in the east. I put pen to page inquiring, what shall I write about? The answer comes back to me, faith. It takes faith to write about faith, to believe that my pen will be led. I have years of experience working with guidance, but still I hesitate, my pen hovering above the page. What is there to say about faith? A great deal. 
Another word for faith is trust, and trust is something built over time. My guidance says, you are well and carefully led. And so I put pen to page, asking, in what direction? A word at a time, a thought at a time. The answer is revealed. I am asked to have faith in my own unfolding wisdom. I am told that faith equals trust, equals security in an unknown future. All is well, my guidance tells me, and so I strive to believe in benevolence. For 42 years, I have followed a spiritual path, and despite my fears and doubts, all has always been well. Perhaps it's because I've made a commitment. I have consciously turned my will and my life over to the care of God. Ups and downs notwithstanding, I have always remembered my bargain. In dark times, I have asked, I wonder what God is up to. In short, I practiced faith. My curiosity sought a silver lining and, sure enough, there was always one to be found. As my experience built, faither became easier. God hadn't brought me this far to be dropped. You are not abandoned, my guidance promised me. The reassuring words gave me hope, and hope in turn led to further faith. My friend Jeanette tells me, Guidance is always present. Depending on guidance, my faith is tested and increased. I put pen to page asking to be led, and guidance assures me, you are carefully, you are led carefully and well. Again, the words invite faith forward. If I am indeed led carefully and well, then what is there to fear? My friend, the late Jean, Jane Cecil, counseled me, there's always a choice between faith and fear. Choose faith. And so I come to exercise a spiritual muscle. It took effort to choose faith, but the effort was rewarding. Faith became a habit, a tested response to life. Faith built upon faith. Life was no longer a free fall. Faith was my parachute. And so when I am directed to write about faith, I find myself brimming with optimism. The good news is that faith is available to all of us. At first, a flyer into the unknown, it becomes with practice a chosen response to life. It allows us to meet apparent adversity with equanimity. If faith without works is dead, it allows us to do works and hence become alive. Faith builds upon itself, creating more faith. We come to trust faith and rely upon it, so the directive to write about faith becomes a task gladly undertaken. Faith, after all, is the good news. Believing in faith, I am indeed well and carefully led. Write for guidance. Recall a time when you acted in faith. What was the result? Now bring pen to page and fill in the following. Number one, I had faith when. Number two, I could use more faith around. Number three, my guidance encourages me to have faith about. St. Augustine says, Solvatur amblando. It is solved by walking. The power of walking. It's mid-afternoon on a bright and sunny day when I set out with Lily for her daily walk. Opening the door to the courtyard, she scampers ahead of me, tugging at her leash. Wait up, girl, I tell her, hurrying to match her strides. She understands my tone, if not my words, and slows her pace. I catch up to her and give her leash a tug to the right, heading up on her dirt road, toward the juniper grove with its chorus of songbirds. They carol to us as we approach. Drawing a breast, they grow more muted. Passing the sibilant grove, we draw near a window, the sight of many deer spottings, but today no deer are in sight. A single squirrel scurries ahead of us, dashing into the safety of one golden camisa bush. A large rabbit is the next creature to appear. Lily yanks at her leash, but the rabbit's too quick for her, and so she drops back to my side, walking now at a dignified pace, depressed by her lack of luck hunting. Distracted as I have been by Lily's antics, I find myself annoyed that my walk isn't its usual meditation. I am accustomed to walks bringing me guidance, and today I need the answers that walking can provide. I headed out with a question, what shall I write about? 
The question eddied in my consciousness as Lily tugged for my attention. As she settled down, matching her pace to my own, the question came into clear focus and, blessedly, with it came an answer. Right about walking. Walking. I stretch my legs and my mind. Focused on my surroundings, I'm cast into the now. And it is there in the precise moment, the precise present. The answers come to me. They come as the hunch, the inspiration, the inkling. The still small voice grows amplified. A football, a footfall at a time, trudging an earthly path. I walk my way into higher realms. I get a sense of a larger benevolent something overarching my reality. This higher power gifts me with a sense of optimism and well-being. I am talked to, as writer Brenda Uland, herself a great walker, put it, by God and his messengers. Walking, I am receptive to higher forces. Walking, I switch my inner dial over from send to receive. And what I receive is wisdom greater than my own. Heading back toward home, Lily strains at her leash. As eager as she was to go out, she's now eager to go home. Once more, she hastens her pace, and once more, I rein her in. I walk slowly and deliberately. My direction, walk right about walking, has filled me with thoughts. I turn them over as we open the garden gate. Crossing the courtyard, I have a sense of satisfaction. Lily dawdles by my rose bushes. Come on, girl, I urge her, opening the door. Our walk has been a good one, after all. T.S. Eliot says, I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. The little dog is stretched out on the hardwood floor. She enjoys the cool of the air conditioning. It penetrates her thick coat and renders her comfortable, despite the late summer's heat. Here, girl, I coax her, patting a spot beside me on the love seat. She hears me, but she ignores me. She's comfortable as she is. She's had her dinner and a nap is called for. Later in the evening, she'll be more compassionate. Right now, she's missing an air show. Ravens cruise past my windows. They light on the pinion tree, glistening ebony. I admire their, their hijinks as they bob with the wind. W.H. Davies says, Now shall I walk or shall I ride? Ride, Pleasure said. Walk. Joy replied. Moving to San Santa Fe 10 years ago, I planned to live in town, walking distance to shops and cafe. That plan was scuttled when I rented my, fir my first house three miles out of town in a grove of juniper and pinion where wildlife flourished. I discovered I craved wilderness, not civilization. And two years ago, I moved still farther from the downtown plaza to the house I eventually bought a snug adobe featuring a courtyard and mountain views. This new house is surrounded by flora and fauna, flocks of ravens, strolling trios of deer. My living room window encompasses a grand vista. At night, I enjoy moonrise over the mountains. My courtyard is surrounded by a high adobe fence. No deterrent to squirrels and raccoons. The courtyard garden features iris, Lily and roses. Its stony floor has proved to be a basking place for lizards. A lone juniper tree stands sentinel near the house. Three birch trees make a miniature grove in the far corner. My house is shaped as a horseshoe circling the courtyard. From the portal I have hung the festive ristra, the gift from artist Ezra Hubbard. I have painted the interior vivid colors, lilac, aqua, and persimmon. Oh, I love the colors. Your house is lovely, exclaimed painter Anna, Annie Brody, a recent visitor. She gifted me with a large purple orchid to keep you company while I'm out of town. The blooming plant complemented the lilac walls hung with Audubon prints in homage to my father's love of birds. The pinion tree adjacent to my living room offers shelter to a bevy of tiny birds. They inhabit its innermost reaches leaving the outer bows to the ravens who peck like sentries on the lookout. Western tanagers and flickers often share their roosts. Seated on my love seat, looking out, I am treated daily to an aviary show. Prajakta Matnak says, Walking through darkness with thoughts full of colors. 
The back of my house is fenced for little, little Lily. The fence is high, six feet, an effective deterrent for coyotes and bears, a safe haven for Lily. Sometimes at night, coyotes prowl the fence line, causing Lily to give a worried woof in response to their ghostly howls. In bear season, the neighbors warn each other, beware. And so I practice alert caution, pulling into my garage. Bears have been known to lurk by high adobe walls, seeking out forage. Caution is the watchword. A three quarters moon rises over the mountains tonight. It's bright silver light shining in my windows. Dimmed by its light, the evening star is a mere candle. Lily, roused from her nap, pads to my bedroom where she takes comfort on a velvet com- covlet. The evening is quiet. No coyotes visit. Moonlight bathes the courtyard and all is calm. At night, I will place a phone call to my friend Jeanette in New York. I picture her apartment, cozy amid glittering high-rises. She pictures my life here in Santa Fe. Our friendship spans the miles as Jeanette asks me, Ready for bed? Clad in pajamas and a fluffy bathrobe, I answer, Yes. Shutting the house down for a night, flickering off lights, shutting Lily's dog door. All is still as I bid Jeanette good night, grateful for the company our phone call has provided. Grateful, too, for my solitary life in sylvan splendor. Write for guidance. Take pen to page and write out a question that's been lingering. Listen to what you hear in response. Now, lace up your shoes and go out for a solo walk. 20 minutes is enough. Bring your question with you on your walk. When you return home, return once more to the page. What occurred to you as you walked? Soren Kierkegaard says, I have walked myself into my best thoughts, and I know of no thought so burdensome that one cannot walk away from it. The Benevolence of Guidance. Mother Teresa says, Prayer is not asking. Prayer is putting oneself in the hands of God at his disposition and listening to his voice in the depth of our hearts. Lakota Elder Scott Thomas calls me for an abbreviated moment. I know you need to write, he says. I wish you guidance. I'll talk to you tomorrow. With that brief note of well-wishing, he hangs up. I'm grateful for his call, comfortable in his, its intention. Scott intends me well, and his wish for me to have guidance is welcome. Scott himself relies upon guidance coming to him daily from what he calls the invisible world. Like me, he makes a practice of seeking counsel from those who have passed on, and so his call to me tonight cues me to reach out to my deceased beloveds. Write about benevolence. I hear first from my late friend Jane Cecil, who had an unshakable faith in the goodness of God. Living her life one day at a time, she always found the good in the days unfolding. Call her with an apparent catastrophe and she'd point you to the silver lining. Worried about finances? God will provide. Worried about health? God is the dear and glorious physician. Worried as I am now about creativity, Jane assures me that the creator is a fountain of ideas. Only tap in. God is benevolent, Jane believed, and believes still from her perch in the afterlife. When I ask her for guidance, I am told, Julia, I am at your side. And I do feel Jane is with me a comforting presence ever assuring me of God's benevolence. I keep her picture on my refrigerator. I next turn to the late Alberta Hanstein, a breeder of championship Morgan horses. Like Jane, Alberta remains a vivid and spirited soul. Her language retains the flavor of the horse show ring. Julia, you are a champion, she tells me. I give you stamina and grace. I confess to Alberta that I'm nervous speaking and teaching, fatigued by a restless night's sleep caused by my anxiety. Alberta assures me, you will do well. In death as in life, Alberta is a staunch optimist. Her optimism brims over. You are well led, she states confidently. And her confidence like Jane's faith is catching. All will be well, I am told. I thank Alberta for her ease. Abraham Lincoln says, to ease another's heartache is to forget one's own. 
Benevolence and optimism char characterize the messages I receive. My guidance is filled with hope, hope for a benevolent and optimistic future. I am tutored daily in positivity. Those who have passed on share their overview. Those who remain with me here in the visible world seek out higher realms and higher forces. Scott Thomas prays to the ancestors, to the spirits. I pray to Jane and Alberta, to higher forces, and when I'm bold enough, to the higher power. No matter what name we choose, guidance is always available. As we avail ourselves to higher wisdom, we are led carefully and well. We are assured, do not doubt our goodness. We intend you great good. That and there is no error in your path. Great goodness flows to you. And so as we check in with higher forces, we are assured of our future in higher realms. God indeed is benevolent and we have great cause for optimism. Amit Kalantri says, kind people are the best kind of people. Night has fallen. A full moon rises over the mountains, luminous and pale. My phone shrills and the caller one more time is Scott Thomas, ever peaceful and calm. He is just checking on me, wondering if my day has gone well, which blessedly it has. I have walked on the treadmill, walked Lily, and worked out. My physical exertions give me endorphins, nature's booster rockets promoting well-being. I find myself optimistic and well-balanced. All systems are go as I head into my evening's writing. But what to write about? A single word of guidance comes to me, candor. The world needs candor, and candor can be cultivated. To be candid is to be authentic, to speak our truth without censorship. For many of us, this is an elusive act. We filter our words through a screen of what we consider acceptable. Candor eschews such censorship. It demands that we consider all our prompting acceptable. Yes, even the ugly duckling thoughts that we are tempted to hide. How can we resist the temptation to tailor our thoughts? To begin with, we must practice self-acceptance, saying to ourselves, all parts of me are welcome here. Such self-acceptance takes practice, and we can best practice it through our morning pages. Put simply, morning pages are an exercise in self-disclosure. Undertaken first thing upon awakening, before our defenses are in place, they tutor us in honesty and self-revelation. In the pages, we are authentic and vulnerable. We write, this is what I want more of, this is what I want less of. Our opinions and disclosures often surprise us. I didn't know I felt that way. We mentally exclaim, nothing is off limits. All thoughts are equally valid, joyous or disgruntled, happy or sad. There is no wrong way to write pages. They may be lively or loving, interesting or dull. They give us a glimpse of our undefended mind. In a word, we're candid and the candor carries over from our writing into our speech. We find ourselves saying the previously unsayable, Honesty becomes our currency, authenticity the coin of the realm. We experience a new freedom and a new self-respect. As we speak our truth, we validate ourselves and our perceptions. Others sense our solid core. We are trustworthy. Our candor yields us so. Writing our morning thoughts, we have become intimate with ourselves. Our self-intimacy renders us able to forge intimate bonds with others. As we become human to ourselves, we dare to be known to others. Our candor paves the way for authentic relationships. Like the full moon in the nighttime sky, we are clearly visible, shedding our light on those who surround us, gifting them with honesty and authenticity. To thine own self be true. We pay attention to the dictum. True to ourselves, we are rendered true to others. Candor wins the day. Anne Frank says, no one has ever become poor from giving. Asking for aid for the many needs of my beloveds, I am assured, Julia, your beloveds are in my custody and care. I take up this cue praying, Dear God, please give everything to everyone they need. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> I messed up. <laughs> Dear God, Please give everyone everything they need. <sighs> there it is. 
I try not to dictate the details of my request. Tutored to pray for knowledge of God's will and the power to carry it out, I strive to align my will with the highest power, with the higher power. I do this by writing out my concerns and the guidance I receive. I am told, do not doubt my goodness. And then I realize that my faith is a benevolent God is something that I must daily reinforce by seeking still more guidance. So now I ask, is there more for me to say about guidance? I hear, Julia, you are led by example. And what is that example? I practice guidance. I practice asking for guidance at all turns, in all arenas of my life. There is nothing too small or too large to seek advice on. Take now, my guidance tells me my book is at an end. Julia, I hear you. You have demonstrated how guidance works in your life. Your readers can follow your lead. At its core, writing for guidance acts on a desire for divine assistance, a reaching on, a reaching out beyond our human wisdom to a higher octave. All in all, this book seeks to demonstrate that guidance is available to each of us on every topic, always. Write for guidance. Look back through the guidance you have written. Does it have a tone of benevolence? Have you come to see, as I have, the value of asking for guidance in any and all aspects of our lives? It is my hope that you have shared in this comforting and helpful practice I use every day. Moving forward, can you commit to daily morning pages and daily writing for guidance?